had a, quite a distinguished voice, talking voice, and you know, an actor's voice. And they probably thought, who the hell is this? He said, in the instrumental break, he said, I'd like to do a little dance. You will forgive me, won't you? I thought, we said, what's he doing? We're supposed to be rock and roll. We're supposed to be like, oh, I'm rock and roll, like, I swear, and that, and go with women. He's gone on, he's done this number, and they've done the instrumental break, and he's done this dance. I can't do it in heaven. He's done this dance across the stage. He's got this sort of thing, he's worked it all out. They were absolutely mental. I thought, there's only one way to do this, and that's to play it as an actor. So I'm going to go out and be a pop star. The moment I saw you I think she was sort of like overwhelmed by it all, you know, he didn't, didn't really understand it. He couldn't understand why they had this sort of, this fame. Uh, but I mean, he was good. He was good on stage, he was well produced. And uh, it went down, he, he used to go down a storm. He never heard anything, mind, because you know, there was so much screaming and shouting going on, he didn't know what he was singing. It was deafening, all these girls screaming, those high-pitched screams. You couldn't really hear yourself sing anyway. I'm sure the audience couldn't hear you sing. And um, if you did get into any trouble, all you had to do was sort of flip a hip. All the screams would sort of go up and, uh, you know, so it didn't matter if you forgot lyrics or whatever. John Layton was the biggest singer around. He released an album and further singles, which were hits, if not huge smashes. Gonzalez, don't you leave me all alone? It was in after the weekend shopping for my mother's needs some tortillas and chili pepper. Manager Robert Stigwood decided the time was right to assume the role of record producer. He was in charge of John's subsequent records, recorded at EMI's Abbey Road Studios. I'm just a fool who's been treated so cruel. Here's another way to make some money, make some hit records and become a record producer. And that, that's probably, he thought maybe, well, it, this is easy, but it, obviously it's not that easy. We had to move on from the style of um, John and Remember Me and Wildwind. We had to switch to other styles, other, other sorts of songs. I always sung songs I was told to sing. I never really said, I didn't really like that song. A lot of songs I didn't particularly like, but I sung them because they, they said, oh no, this is a great song. And then I would be sort of bullied into singing it in a, in a certain way. They'd tell me, do, do a bit of Elvis, do, 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 do. make the voice quiver. Make love to me. Me once again before we say good night. I'm not Elvis, I'm, I'm me. I, I want to sing it like I sing it. I leave Elvis Presley to sing it <clears throat> like he sings it. But So there were a few sort of um, uh, directorial problems, if you like. So help me, dear, a chills run up my spine. But don't you know, I love you so I won't be happy until you're mine when 62, 63, I was really at the height of sort of my singing career And in 1962, a man called John Sturgis An American film director John Sturgis directed Magnificent Seven, Gunfight at the OK Corral Many, many more But he came over to England to cast The Great Escape I love you, Mabel 
love you as much as I am able. And he offered me the role of Willie the Tunnel King alongside Charles Bronson. We must have been about three or four months into making The Great Escape and John Sturgis came up to me and he said, um, he said, hey John, I hear you're a singer. And I said, oh, didn't you know? He said, no, I had no idea. I thought maybe one of the reasons that I got The Great Escape was on the back of the fact that I had a lot of success as a singer. Because, you know, everybody thinks about box office. But uh, he had no idea. It was my pleasure to welcome back to this country a young man who's undoubtedly one of Britain's finest talents. He's been away in Germany and Hollywood making a film, as you know, called The Great Escape. The dynamic, Mr. Fabulous in person, Johnny Layton! Returning to his singing career after making The Great Escape, John was still as popular as ever and he continued to tour the UK and abroad, although the hits were declining. The music scene was changing with the emergence of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. The era of the solo rock and roll singer was coming to an end. At the beginning of 64, I did a tour with various people. It was my tour and I sort of topped it and there was this band, the Rolling Stones. Robert Stigwood promoted that, you see, and that was his stable of stars and we were just brought in to add ticket sales and unfortunately for everybody we took over. When I came on, these girls were going, we want the stones, we want... <laughs> I couldn't do it, I couldn't perform. I'm not, not being big-headed, but the kids just didn't want to hear anything else. I see the joint was rocking, going round and round. Yeah, he's a man of rocking, got a crazy sound. And they never stopped rocking, till the moon went down. It became exceedingly difficult for me to go on after them. I had to take me a chance. Uh, on about the third night, John said, I think you should close and I'll, I'll do the other, I'll go on before you and Mike Sarn can close the first half. And uh, it was mutually agreed and uh, there was no sort of cockiness with us about it or, or disappointment from him. He just saw the lighting was on the wall. You know, it was a, as they say, a new wind was blowing, you know, and um, he was one of the sort of old school. The likes of me, for instance, we'd put on silk mohair suits, sparkly suits, and, uh, you know, shirts and maybe a tie. And, I mean, you really looked the business. It felt artificial and phony, and it's like um, seeing the future catch up with you very quickly and sort of wipe you out. But for me, it didn't matter, because I was... I. I wanted to get back to acting anyway, and singing was actually getting in the way a bit. Immediately following that 1964 tour, John signed for the film The Guns of Batazi, starring opposite Peter Sellers' new wife, Britt Eklund. I seem to have a reputation in those days of um, certain leading ladies. Um, I tended to sort of uh, take out to dinner and um, see socially. Uh, which I, to be honest with you, I had every intention of doing with Brit, Brit Eklund, even though she was Mrs. Sellers at the time. But anyway, um, yeah, he uh, seemed to be slightly worried about it, and she was uh, ordered to leave the film because of his concern. Her name, Mia Farrow, 19-year-old daughter of Maureen O'Sullivan. She's been picked to replace Brit Eklund. Bridger, remember, was starring in Guns of Batazzi when she decided to fly to Hollywood to be near her husband, Peter Sellers. Now the part will be played by this cool, blonde newcomer who took this press call at Pinewood just before going on the set. I socialised me if I were instead, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Got a feeling like I'm dreaming. But that year, I did the tour with the Rolling Stones. And I did Guns of Batazzi. Then I actually did another film called Every Day's a Holiday with Mike Sarr. Mine, since you came along. Every day's a holiday. Yes! Listen, 
pass on to me, you pretty thing. Unable to compete with the bluesy music of the Beatles and the Stones, John signed a three-picture deal with 20th Century Fox. He was off to Hollywood to star opposite Frank Sinatra. Not bad for a has-been pop star. I was doing Von Ryan's Express. We were doing the interiors and uh, on a stage in 20th Century Fox. Mia was on the next stage doing Peyton Place. So Mia came to visit me on the uh, set of Von Ryan's Express. And I only turned my back a minute, just one minute. And there she is talking to Frank Sinatra. That night she calls me, says, John, what do I do? I said, what do you mean, what do you do? She says, Frank has asked me to Palm Springs for the weekend. <laughs> I said, keep me out of it, I want to work in this town. <laughs> so off she went to Palm Springs and um, <clears throat> of course the rest is, is history. She became Mrs. Sinatra. So um, I feel I had a hand in that marriage. Over the next 20 years, John Layton enjoyed a Hollywood career acting in epics Krakatoa, East of Java and The Idol. He even had his own television series, Jericho. He also became a successful producer and businessman. However, once the movie roles became scarcer, he was drawn back to Britain and surprised to discover that his early hits were still being played on the radio and there was a demand for him to perform again. It seems that it's kind of come back full circle to the point where these old songs are not just acceptable once again, but have enormous nostalgic interest. persuade him to sort of come out uh, to go back on the road, you know. I said, because there's people out there who'd love to see you again, which I proved right. The knickers were still being thrown on the stage part. In fact, they were slightly bigger than they were in the 60s, but... <laughs> it's a Saturday night, we're having a time to the You know, I'd always seen John as, as basically a, a very fine actor who sings. So when he joined the Sully Gold Rock and Roll Tour, I was concerned. But he proved us all wrong. It became really a, a, um, a, an integral part of the show. Shout, 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 knock As somebody said to me in 1964, you'll be back in 30 years' time doing these shows, I would have said, no way. I love every minute of it. The only difference now is that nobody screams. So you've actually got to get up and sing. <laughs> yes, I'll 